Hi, it's Mr. Anderson and welcome to Biology Essentials video number 14. This is on environmental matter exchange. In other words, how life exchanges matter with its environment. Uh, the picture I started with is a picture of Biosphere 2. Um, before I talk about Biosphere 2, I should probably talk about Biosphere 1. Biosphere 1 is our planet and wherever life is found on our planet. But in the late 80s, early 90s, some people built Biosphere 2. It's massive. And the idea was that you would lock people inside here and they would stay inside there for two years. Now, they would constantly get energy in the form of sunlight, but all the matter inside there would have to be recycled for two years. Now, that seems crazy, but that's our planet. In other words, the matter on our planet has been recycled over and over over and over again, we constantly get an influx of energy, but the matter that we have today is the matter that we've always had on our planet. And so how we exchange that matter is super important. So to summarize, what I'm going to talk about is how we utilize uh, matter, how we get matter from our environment. Um, the big four types of matter I'm going to talk about are, are water, uh, carbon dioxide, or excuse me, carbon, nitrogen, and, and phosphorus, um, and how we acquire those things. Now, in order to acquire it, I'll talk a little bit about surface area to volume and the ratio of that, and two examples of those in living things, and how we want to maximize our surface area to volume ratio. I'll talk of the importance of water and how it acts as a universal, quote unquote, solvent. Um, and I'll also talk about why carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus are important in the four major macromolecules that we have. In other words, carbon is found in all four of these. It's ubiquitous in our macromolecules. Nitrogen is important. It's found in uh, proteins, and it's also found in nucleic acids. And then finally, phosphorus is important. Phosphorus it, it is found in lipids and also has a huge role in nucleic acids. And so that seems kind of confusing, but I'll try to pare that down uh, a little bit, hopefully. First of all, I want to talk about a little bit of math, the ratio of surface area um, to volume. In other words, the ratio of a surface area of an object to its volume. And so to make it simple, I started with a simple three-dimensional figure called a cube. And so let's first do the math on a cube that has a side of two units, and then I'll show you the surface area to volume of a side when it has side area one. And so let's first of all, I'll start with the surface area. So the surface area is going to be all the sides that are on the outside, so you can think of it like a dice. Uh, and so to do that, I'm going to have to take the surface area of one side, so the surface area of this would then be two uh, times two. And so the surface area of this side would be 4. But the surface area of that is 4, and that is 4, and this over here is 4. And so it would be 6 times 4, and so it's going to be 24. And now let me do the volume. Well, since this is 2 and that's 2, the volume is going to be um, 2 times 2 times the depth is 2. And so it's going to be 8. And so the surface area to volume ratio of a cube that is uh, a, a side length of, of 2 is going to be Three. Um, if I were to do the same thing over again with a side area of 1, well the side area of 1, that means each side would be 1, so this total would be a surface area of 6. The volume would be 1 times 1 times 1, or it would be 1, and so it would be 6. And so what happened to our surface area to volume ratio as we made our cube smaller? it got bigger. And I could keep doing math for a long time, and if you were to do this over and over again, you'd find that the surface area to volume ratio is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger over time. And so why are cells small? Why do we find folding? Why do we find root hairs? All of these things because if we can maximize the surface area to volume ratio, we make things smaller and we can get more of this matter inside. And so these are the root hairs. In other words, a root are going to have these tiny hairs. And what that does is maximizes the surface area so it can take in more matter because a plant needs to get these um, in, in essential nutrients inside. And also there are fungus growing on here, which actually increases the surface area even more. And it also tells us why cells are small. So it also tells us why... Um, Red blood cells even have a little curve on the inside to maximize that surface area volume. And so no matter how big you are, if you're an elephant, the cells of you are going to be the same as the cells of a mouse. And the reason why is we're maximizing that surface area to volume. That's a little too much math. And so life requires four major macromolecules. And those four major macromolecules are carbohydrates. We use that for energy. 
proteins, that's pretty much what we're made up of. When you're looking at me, you're just looking at uh, proteins. Lipids, uh, lipids are super important. They make up the uh, cell membranes that surround all living things. And then finally, nucleic acids. That's going to be the RNA, the DNA. It passes hereditary material from generation to generation. And so um, all of these things require matter. And so water, I'll start with that first. Water is a polar molecule. What that means, it has, if, if this is oxygen and these are the hydrogens, it's going to have a negative charge here and a positive charge up here. As a result of that, since water is polar, it's really good at absorbing water. It's really good at surrounding uh, hydrophilic proteins, surrounding cell membranes, at least on the outside. And since uh, nucleic acids have a charge, they really well. Uh, they do a good job of dissolving those as well. And so, why does life require water? It requires water so it can act as a solvent to surround living material. Because if it wasn't, then we wouldn't have all these chemical reactions. We really wouldn't have life. And where we ever find life on our planet, we also find water and vice versa. And so water is required for all of these things. What about carbon? Well, carbon, you can see it right here. Carbon makes up the skeletons of, of sugar, makes up the proteins, makes up the skeletons of, of uh, nucleic acid, and also makes up lipids. Um, so this whole hydrocarbon tail and the head is going to be made up of carbon as well. Let's go nitrogen. Nitrogen, where is nitrogen found? Well, nitrogen is found in amino acids, and amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. So nitrogen is going to be found inside proteins. And then nitrogen also is going to be found on the inside of uh, DNA. And, and, and the nitrogenous bases require nitrogen as well. And so to make all of these things, we require these essential uh, chemicals. And then finally, phosphorus. Well, where's phosphorus found? Phosphorus is going to be found in the heads of these phospholipids uh, that make up the membrane. And then phosphates are also going to be found to, on the side chains of, the, of DNA, or it's going to be found in the backbone of DNA and RNA. And so if we don't have carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, if we don't have water, then we don't have life. And so we require this matter from our environment. Now, the interesting thing, though, is that it's recycled. In other words, the sugar that I had in my breakfast cereal this morning, that carbon doesn't just go away. That carbon inside me will be eventually, as I've been broken down, will be used by other living things, will become carbon dioxide, and so that'll be recycled over time. In other words, we're set with a given amount of each of these uh, atoms. And so we have uh, four cycles. We have the water cycle, um, and that just is going to move water around. How do I get water inside me? I'm going to do that just by drinking water. We've got the carbon cycle. Carbon cycle, most of that actually sits as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We take it in through photosynthesis, and we get rid of it through respiration. Nitrogen, we're getting through bacteria uh, in the soil, actually, we're... Um, fixing nitrogen in the atmosphere and making it usable and then as we die we return that nitrogen and then phosphorus is actually going to sit here in the rocks and then we get that plants will get that through the soil and then we get that by eating plants and so we require these four things these this matter um, it's set on our planet we live in this biosphere um, that is planet earth and so we constantly use those um, those nutrients over and over and over again. We use those atoms over and over again, but luckily we have an influx of energy from the sun. And so the next time you're thinking, you're drinking a little bit of water, you should think to yourself, the atoms inside that water were once inside water that Einstein drank or water that a dinosaur drank or water in a primordial sea. Um, and so matter is constantly exchanged between living things uh, and uh, through time. And so I hope that's helpful.